Bill, we've included an extract from your book, The Biggest Estate on Earth in the Invisible Thread, and it's a groundbreaking and absolutely fascinating read, and it explodes a number of myths. Can you tell us about the book and what its beginnings were? The book is uh, an argument about how Aboriginal people managed the uh, continent of Australia in 1788. 1788 is a shorthand for that moving frontier of settlement that began in Sydney Cove. So it goes on for the next 140 odd years. And what the book argues is that Aboriginal people deliberately organised the vegetation and located it so that they knew where the plants were and because they knew where the plants were they could organise to put the animals where they wanted them. So instead of being aimless hunter-gatherers who were wandering around on the off chance of finding whatever tucker they wanted, they actually knew where they were going and they knew what they'd find when they got there. Um, so, you know, Europeans uh, perhaps spend eight hours a day working, Aboriginal people by and large could only, needed only spend three hours a day for what they needed in food and shelter much more efficient system than we've assumed. And, you know, that idea that was perpetuated by the settlers that, you know, Aboriginals were just um, sort of drifting rather aimlessly, very basic skills as hunter-gatherers, that's kind of filtered down through the generations, hasn't it? Yeah, the, the belief that uh, Aborigines were aimless starts long before 1788. I mean, the Europeans coming just assume that savages had no sorts of control and no sorts of management at all. And we're still on the, on the tail end of that, or I hope it's the tail end. Uh, we still think that, you know, we're civilised, they're barbaric, and therefore they couldn't have done uh, the sorts of things that I'm arguing that they did do. And you show very clearly in your book that they used very systematic, complex land management, you know, using fire and the life cycles of plants. Um, and as I was reading the book, it becomes very obvious how these days, the way we burn off to try and prevent bushfires, for example, it's very haphazard in, um, you know, in comparison to this incredibly complex system. Why do you think it's taken us so long to realise that? Because, I mean, there's obviously a lot of lessons here for us in the way that we're managing the land currently. There are a lot of lessons, especially in relation to fire, and I don't think we've realised it. I, I can sort of think of five stages in Aboriginal burning, and the first of them is to maintain fuel, no, to uh, control fuel, uh, and then the next four are all about uh, preserving species, making sure there's no extinctions and so on. We haven't even got to, to stage one. We don't know how to control fuel, nor do we really uh, try and work it out. For example, the, People will know the terrible fires around Melbourne in, which destroyed King Lake and Churchill and those other places. And now people there are rejoicing at the scrub coming back. Uh, what Aboriginal people would have done is the very next winter they would have burnt that scrub coming back to make sure you didn't get the kind of forest that, that destroyed uh, those towns because in 40 years that forest will certainly be there and we'll have to go through it again. So Aborigines would never have allowed a fire like that to have happened. Yeah, I mean, you talk in the book about how one Indigenous family might burn up to, f or light up to 5,000 fires a year, which is an incredible number, so they're, you know, burning all the time. But also that very specific knowledge of the land, you know, where some places need to be burnt every year, another place might be only, you know, every 50 years. And there was one comment in the book by an Indigenous lady who'd been through an area that hadn't been burnt for a long time, and she called it dirty land. And I thought that was such an, an interesting, you know, that's a completely different way of looking at things than we have been doing. Yeah, it's very common for Aboriginal people to say that country's dirty because it hasn't been burned. They really think of fire as cleansing, in the, almost in the biblical sense. I, mean, I think they're more precise than the Bible, but the idea of a cleansing fire is very much in Aboriginal thinking. And uh, they also think of fire as an ally. So they in effect will perform the ceremonies and talk to it and in effect persuade it to go out into country and, and burn it. Uh, 
it's a much more sophisticated relationship with fire, I think, than anything that we can imagine. Yeah, there's this um, quote that I've got here that um, from an elder in Arnhem Land that you include in your book, which I love, where he says, you sing the country before you burn it. In your mind, you see the fire. You know where it is going. You know yep. where it will stop. Uh, a, a, a good fire manager, and there are usually specialist fire managers, can do exactly that. He knows what time of the day to light it, or she knows what time of the day to light it. Um, if you only want a small fire, you light it in late afternoon, for example, so that uh, night and the falling dew and so on will put it out, or by dusk it'll, it'll reach a hill where it's battling to go up the hill and then the dew will come and finish it off. If you want a bigger fire, you uh, wait until the day's a bit hotter and you start earlier in the day. Uh, if you want a really hot fire, it's sometimes necessary, you wait until there's a wind. Um, whereas when we're lighting fires, even uh, hazard control fires as they're now called, we have to give a fortnight's notice and it goes over the radio and so on. You don't have that intimate and instant relationship with country which really makes fire management possible. So what do you think we as a country need to do in terms of our fire management now? Well, I think we could uh, learn a lot from Aboriginal people. Of course, we can't go back to 1788. Um, they didn't have fences and they didn't have haystacks and things like that, which prevent us introducing that kind of management. But there are many places where what they did with fire, all the many varieties of fire we could imitate in Northern Australia and in Central Australia, for example. And one way to do that is instead of having Aboriginal people as advisors to parks and wildlife and, and equivalent organisations, they should be in charge. They should be making the decisions. Uh, they have the expertise, they're on country, they want to learn, they're prepared to stay put. So we need to invert our whole thinking about the relationship between bureaucrats and local experts. Invert that hierarchy. And what do you hope more broadly that your book achieves? I hope it'll increase uh, respect for the Aboriginal achievement, which really is in world class. I mean, they, they kept their society going for at least 40,000 years. No other civilization's done that. And farming civilizations have either come to a bad end or an uncertain future. Uh, so we could simply learn a lot about our long-term viability. Yeah. Now you recently won the Prime Minister's Award for Australian History. <clears throat> what does winning an award like that mean for you? Well, it means a lot of bread in the basket for, <laughs> for a start. <laughs> that was tremendous. I mean, I was retired for almost all the time that I wrote this book, so this is uh, tremendous. Um, and now I have to think what to do with it. I haven't actually got it yet, by the way, because I've been away, but I've got to think what to do with it, and, and that'll be something relating to Aboriginal people. Um, now tell us about the research process, because you were working on this book, researching it for over a decade, which is an incredible amount of time. Can you tell us about that process from the very beginning through to the end? Well, I suppose I've been thinking about it for at least 40 years. I used to be a wheat lumper carrying bagweed on farms and that meant I used to get out and poke around the bush quite a bit and I got interested in the relationship between trees and soils, how trees could tell you what sort of soils were there and therefore what sort of grass and what sort of animals and so on. And I realised that in fact when you, when you read some of the records that relationship didn't stand up where there should have been uh, uh, trees, there was grass in the early records. That was a, the biggest change. And so I started to puzzle about that, think why was it so? Was it salt? Was it the different soils and so on? And none of those, was it bushfire? None of those made sense. And so that led me to think about Aboriginal uh, activity. Uh, and so I came to the whole question of Aboriginal land management from ecological study. And then in the last uh, 12 years or so, uh, basically it's been a process of looking at the record, comparing that with what's on the ground or seeing something on the ground and going to the record, uh, which is usually explorers' journals, uh, to see what they said about that same country. And when, when you get a discordance, something that uh, shouldn't have been there naturally in inverted commas, 
then trying to explain it. And gradually I pieced together the patterns of Aboriginal fire management. There must be during that process real highs and lows, like you know times when you have exhilarating moments where something falls into place and other times that are frustrating. I didn't find it that. Uh, I mean, I like walking about, but also the evidence is huge. It's enormous. You, you can hardly pick up a book without some little clue in it. Uh, usually things that, that most readers miss, where uh, an explorer, let's say, uh, describes a country very briefly. And uh, most people go over that because it's not, not of interest, you know, where, where somebody meets Aborigines or names something, then that's what they uh, look at. But those small references to the nature of the country is what I was after. And early settlers were doing it all the time. I mean, they were interested in grass. Uh, they first start talking about grass in 1788. They don't talk about gold for another 70 years. It's grass that were what they're after. And so, especially the official explorers, Mitchell and Sturt and people like that, uh, they take good care to say what's uh, grass and what's not. And then surveyors did the same thing. The early surveyors around uh, Canberra, Robert Hoddle, for example, uh, when he's doing his field book, he he writes grass and he writes forest and he puts a dotted line between them to show the boundary, to show a sharp boundary. And the an obvious question is, why is it grass here and, and forest there? And straight away you're into Aboriginal land management. So in terms of the research and the writing, do you enjoy one more than the other? Oh, the research. The research much more, uh, especially the research outside. Writing is hard work. It's hard, lonely work, especially if you're so slow as I am at writing. You know, the number of times I've written a sentence or a paragraph and said, oh, that looks good, but it's wrong. So out, is, out, out it goes. You know, that's one of the problems that a historian has that a novelist doesn't. So how long did it take you to do the actual writing of this book? Uh, really hard work, probably a year, a year full time, and then with bits of drafts and so on that was spread over the last three or four years. And as a historian and a writer, what is it that you like about living in Canberra? Well, I, I used to live in Port Moresby, very hot and very hard to uh, write. It's just, it's just too hot to concentrate. And Canberra's, if anything, a bit the other way. <laughs> but, uh, uh, and that's counter counterintuitive, isn't it? You'd think, well, you'd, uh, you'd sit down in the heat and, and walk about in the cold, but in fact, sitting and writing are two different things. The other things, though, is Canberra's got terrific resources, resources for a writer and for historians. I mean, National Library and uh, the other uh, uh, public institutions and the ANU and so on. But as well as that, the staff in those institutions are tremendous. You know, they see their job as to help people with their projects. And that, that's a terrific help. And there's more of that in Canberra than anywhere else I know. So that's a big plus. And I suppose a bush capital, although it's, you know, thanks to urban infill and people going around lopping branches off gum trees, it, it's, it's less a bush capital than it was, but, but still it, it's well ahead of Sydney and Melbourne and other places. Finally, we've got the um, centenary of Canberra coming up, and um, Canberra tends to get a bad rap outside of outside of the ACT. Um, what do you think people outside of Canberra should know about our city? Well, they should know that it's not only uh, politicians. You know, the people who give Canberra a bad rap don't live here. They're people who have been elected and come here from all over Australia and, and it's their decisions, and their, or at least the reporting of their decisions that give Canberra a bad name. Uh, come and have a look, come and have a look, not only at what has been built here, but in the beautiful uh, surrounds, uh, the hills and lakes and so on. I think uh, if you can come and avoid the middle of winter, <laughs> you, you'll find this is a very nice place.